Um, thank you all for finding us on this rainy, dark evening. Um, but we're so glad to see all these faces, and we're really glad to be able to show off our wonderful library while we're doing this. And I have to remember to keep this very close. I'm not one of those people on the stage all the time doing this. But I'm Kim Audette, and I am part of the group that brought you this tonight. I just want to cover two things before I get into the meat of what we're doing. The two most important things. One is the bathrooms, and they are right out that hallway. The second is that the library has recently um, equipped itself with adaptive hearing equipment. So if anybody needs some help, please see Aaron, who is right there. <laughs> We work well together. It's perfect. So I'm a member of the Sunderland Human Rights Task Force, and a group of us got together and created the Committee for Understanding Anti-Semitism. And I'm going to take one quick minute to ask everybody on the committee to just stand up so people can see you. We've got, there were nine of us who have been working for over a year on this. Thank you, and if you have any questions, we're the ones with the little green stickers on our <laughs> hello tags. So, the Human Rights Task Force and the committee are committed to ensuring that everyone feels welcomed, accepted, and safe in our communities. Um, our committee is composed of concerned citizens from the Sunderland Congregational Church, the Sunderland Public Library, Temple Israel, and other community people from around the area joined us. Our goal is to study the issue of Jewish history in connection with anti-Semitism and its resultant manifestation that we're seeing here now. So, we started, I need to say, we started this work over a year ago, before October 7th. So I know a lot of people have a hard time thinking about anti-Semitism when they're really angry about what's going on in Gaza and Israel. We are not going to really be speaking to that tonight. We are really focusing on anti-Semitism through the ages, and what's happening here in America. And Michael's going to do a great job presenting some of that. So, I would love to have Reverend Randy Calvo give a quick welcome to everybody, and then we're going to have a special treat. Thank you, Kim. And thank you all for uh, coming out. I was sitting right there just outside the, the, the doors and I thought everybody was in front of me and then I turned around and there's just as many people behind me. This is beautiful. Uh, when we did our first one um, over at the church, I was so happy that that many people thought that this was worth their time on a Sunday afternoon to come out and they came out. And on this group that Kim had been talking about, I actually wondered whether you know, doing it twice was, was really feasible. Would people come out twice? And I was happily proven wrong. So thank you very, very much for coming tonight. And I'm really interested in what uh, Professor Hoberman has to say because a lot of the stuff that I've heard um, as a part of this anti-Semitism group has all been new to me. And I'm, I'm closing in on senior citizenhood. I'm almost 65 and I am learning so much stuff about um, what my Jewish brothers and sisters are going through and, it, and it's really startling and it's eye-opening and you know my my focus is you know, probably been like you know the Holocaust or or, or even Israel's history as, as Kim mentioned um, we're trying to separate it you know from the nation of Israel so I'm, I'm half Polish and half and, and half Spanish so when I grew up in the 60s and 70s that means that I had ancestral ties to a communist Poland I had ancestral ties to a right-wing right -wing fascist dictator, Franco in Spain, but no one you know, put that on me as Polish and Spanish here in America. 
Um, but for, for Jewish people, you know, the politics of Israel, it, it almost like it's inseparable. And so that's also something I'm trying to learn more about, um, is that this, this, you know, I think, what is it, the, uh, the, um, the, how did you call it, the oldest, the oldest um, bigotry, the oldest, hatred, oh, hatred. The, the oldest hatred, um, that's a lot to bear. And, and I mentioned at the first uh, gathering, a lot of that has to do with institutional church, and I'm a member of institutional church, I'm a part of institutional church. And so I apologize for that, because institutional church is often given uh, the impetus and the excuse for, for hatred. And, and that I find deeply offensive, and, and so that's why I'm part of this. And, well, well, I, I don't want any compliments for that, because no, I would, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's sadly true. And, um, and, and so I apologize for that, and I, I'm, I'm embarrassed um, that it's done in my religion's name, which means a lot to me, just as the Jewish faith means a lot, whatever faith it is, it means a lot to you. And so I'm here uh, as part of the Sunderland Congregational Church because we were invited to come because they thought it would be meaningful to have a Christian church um, as one of the co-sponsors. And I hope it meant a lot um, to, our, to our friends who are Jewish, but it meant a lot to our church. And uh, of that, I'm very proud of my church that they came on uh, 100%. Uh, it was a unanimous vote to be a co-sponsor of this. And I'm just really proud to be here. I'm really excited to hear what Professor Hoberman has to say. And um, I hope this goes well. Welcome. <laughs> Randy has been one of the best co-partners in this at work, and it's been wonderful to be able to sit down together. That. So I have one little treat before we introduce the speaker. And usually when our group meets, and we meet about once a month, we always start with a land acknowledgement, talking about the native and indigenous people who lived on this land before we came. Well, tonight we're gonna hear a Jewish land acknowledgement. And I'm going to turn it over to the author and the poet. Hi, I'm Yasel Karland. And I just want to say, hearing Randy's words sort of melts me that we have, as Jews, a generational trauma. And to hear words of welcome and words of understanding is food for the soul. Yeah. A Jewish land acknowledgement in America. When I first arrived in this land, this land of freedom and acceptance, escaping for the nth time the murder of my people, becoming the nth generation to escape the murder of my people, I did not know how much the spilled blood of those who were here before us permeates the land on which I walk. I did not know how much the lash-driven labor, not unlike my own in Egypt long ago, not unlike my own millennia ago, built the monuments of this land, built its monuments to freedom, built its monuments to prosperity, built its monuments to inequality, built its monuments to dispossession. Dispossession of its original inhabitants much as we were dispossessed from our land millennia ago, even as we were dispossessed from new homes through millennia and centuries, from countless lands, countless times. I do not recount our sufferings to claim my place in the hierarchy of the oppressed. No, rather, to remember how it felt to have my blood spilled so that I will not spill yours. 
to remember the pain of the lash, so that I will wrest the lash from your taskmaster's hand, to remember the tears of dispossession, so that I will welcome you back to your land and pray that you will welcome me. Um, I'm going to ask Erin to come up and formally introduce our speaker. Enjoy, and please, afterwards, we're going to ask for a little help in evaluating our program and getting a sense of it. So at the end, just know you have one task before you, before you leave tonight. Thank you, Kim. Welcome, everyone, to the Sunderland Public Library. My name is Aaron Faubel, I'm the head of adult services here, and I'm also a member of the Sunderland Human Rights Task Force, and I've been on the organizing committee for tonight's event and the event at the church a few weeks ago. And it's my honor and privilege to introduce to you tonight's speaker. Michael Hoberman is a professor of English studies at Fitchburg State University. He is the author of New Israel, New England, Jews and Puritans in Early America, and the book A Hundred Acres of America, The Geography of Jewish American Literary History. His forthcoming book, Imagining Early American Jews, will be published by Oxford University Press in late 2025. And he is currently writing a book about Theodore Satius Solomons, the Jewish conservationist and founder of California's John Muir Trail. How many knew about that? Michael's articles on Jewish American history appear in Tablet Magazine, including an article on Theodore Solomons. And if you haven't yet looked at Michael's articles in Tablet Magazine, I encourage you to explore them at tabletmag.com slash contributors slash Michael hyphen Hoberman. If you don't remember that, just you can Google, it. Google <laughs> Michael Hoberman Tablet Magazine and you'll get right to it. Michael's writings are engaging, thought-provoking, carefully and meticulously researched, and best of all, highly readable. In other words, scholarship at its best. But you don't have to take my word for it. We have Michael Hoberman in the flesh here tonight, so you will shortly see exactly what I mean. Professor Hoberman will enlighten us with a lecture that will contain interactive components titled Only in America, a brief history of anti-Semitism in the United States. So please join me in welcoming Michael Hoberman to the Sunderland Public Library. help us explore anti-Semitism in the American context. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Kim. Thank you to all the other members of the committee uh, who made this happen. It's been a long work in progress. Thank you to my wife, Janice, who, made, who turned these slides into something that is palatable mm -hmm. to the human eye. Uh, I want to say a little bit about our format tonight, first of all. Um, so, early on in my talk, there will be a brief interactive activity uh, where you'll be asked to talk to each other about, uh, you know, it, it's yet to be announced what it is. Uh, there are going to be a few short exchanges in the middle portions of the talk where I'll ask maybe two or three people to just volunteer some responses to some questions I'll pose. And then, uh, after the talk is over, we'll have a brief Q&A and then we will divide up into groups for a group discussion, an in-depth group, group discussion on the subject of, okay, now we know about anti-Semitism in America, what do we do about it? So that's how this whole thing is being put together. All right, so I'm gonna start by telling a little bit uh, about um, a subject I teach at Fitchburg, which is Jewish American literature. I teach that course maybe every three years or so. And very often on the first day of class, uh, the, Fitchburg, by the way, has very few Jewish students. Uh, which I can explain some other time. But um, so very few students in that class know the first thing 
about uh, Jewish history or Jewish culture, let alone Jewish literature, but they're ready to learn about it. The first day of class, I often ask them, uh, what do you think the percentage of Jews in the United States is? Mm -hmm. And uh, you get all kinds of wild figures in response. 10%, 15%, I think one time uh, a student volunteered, 30% of Americans are Jewish. Uh, and so this is an interesting thing when you take into account the fact that, uh, as you'll see from our first slide here, Jews are in fact 2.4% of the American population and 0.02% of the world population. So how does that happen and why does that happen? I think it has to do with uh, the idea that um, Jews occupy a lot of space in the human imagination and in the American imagination by extension. Um, Jews get talked about a lot, thought about a lot, and written about a lot, and that has been true for about 2,000 years uh, throughout the world and in this country uh, for as long as we've been a country. This has in part to do with the fact that Jews play a central role in the Bible, right? The, in in the, the Hebrew Bible, otherwise known as the Old Testament. Um, we also have just this notion that, uh, you know, Jerusalem, Israel is sort of, at least in the old world, it was thought, as this map tells you, that Jerusalem and Israel are literally at the center of the world, the crossroads of the world. And for that matter, news events of the last year or 10 years or 15 or 20 or 100 years would sort of give you the same impression. So Jews take up a lot of space in the imagination, and that is in part an explanation for the pervasiveness of anti-Semitism, not just uh, in the world, but in particular in the United States. I think also um, there is, uh, besides uh, the role that Jews play in the Bible, there is also the fact that uh, in so many parts of the world, the arrival of Jews, the presence of Jews, the movement of Jews from one place to another is very often a harbinger of change, of modernity, of industrialization, of migrants, uh, and, and so on. So, um, you know, images like this one here, of uh, this is a 19th century image of a Jewish peddler, speak to a certain quality that, uh, let's say, people, not just anti-Semites, but people imagining Jews around the world have associated Jews with change uh, and, and movement uh, and dynamism, and sometimes, of course, with problematic things in the world. And this is also true within the context of American history, not necessarily in a negative sense, but you might once have seen this image here. This was the, uh, this was the proposal from Benjamin Franklin for the Great Seal of the United States, and it's an image of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. So within American history and American culture, there also is an association of Jews with American themselves in American history, that the Puritans in particular borrowed the image of Jews, borrowed the stories of Jews, and very often applied those stories to their own narratives in the New World. This is in part explains how come a group that, again, comprises 2.4% of our population uh, occupies so much space in the imagination. So anti-Semitism, and for that matter, philo-Semitism, I would say, is always a reflection of what the non-Jewish world thinks, desires, fears, can't figure out. Its misgivings, its dilemmas, its blind spots. That's my suggestion here. And so attention to anti-Semitism can be a powerful form of historical insight. It is not, anti-Semitism, by my reckoning, is not a mystical force. It's not the enigmatic product of some archetypal human psychology, I don't believe that. I think it can and should best be understood as any other historical phenomenon within its context. And uh, the philosopher Her Hannah Arendt uh, says something to that effect in, in her book on anti-Semitism, published I think in 1947. Essentially, you don't, I'm not gonna read this whole quotation here, but basically she says, it's no less rational to think that anti-Semitism is a mystical force uh, in human psychology than it is to believe in the crazy things that people say about Jews. Both approaches are irrational. So we need to understand anti-Semitism as a dynamic historical force that is always changing. Now, I'm gonna pose a question that is, I'm hoping to uh, frame my talk. How bad has anti-Semitism been in America? And has it been different from anti-Semitism elsewhere in other parts of the world? 
Is, an, is America an exception to the rule of anti-Semitism in other parts of the world? And I guess I would like to begin answering this question by acknowledging certain things uh, from, uh, from, the, th from the start. The sorts of violent, mass-scale, institutionally enforced anti-Semitism that characterized the medieval era, the modern, early modern era in Europe, the, the sorts of events that fueled pogroms in Russia and the Holocaust, those things have not happened in the United States to date. And it's important for us to acknowledge that those things have not happened here because we're not gonna get a grip on American anti-Semitism if we, if we glom those things on to our experiences here. But that doesn't mean that anti-Semitism hasn't been a factor in American history or that Jews and non-Jews haven't been affected by it. I hope you won't mind, I'm going to indulge in just a little bit of personal history there because here because I think it might be useful to kind of give you a sense of how I've experienced anti-Semitism in a very limited way in my life uh, as a way of introducing. I have basically three themes tonight. I'm going to use my own personal experience, uh, relatively unimportant as it is in the overall scheme of things, as a way to introduce these themes. So I have been an American Jew my whole life. Uh, and I was the knowing target of anti-Semitism really only during one phase of my life. Only one phase of my life. And I'm not going to claim that that experience of anti-Semitism that I went through at that time made me a victim. Uh, for that matter, I think that I might just as easily argue that I achieved some kind of personal growth as the result of what I experienced uh, during this period of my life. But I do want to talk about it to, again, to put some context onto understanding uh, how anti-Semitism works in American culture. And I think my own experience might be slightly instructive here. So let me um, tell you that the experience that I had basically spanned the years 1978 and 1982. And that was because those were the years that I was a student at a New England boarding school. Uh, I don't need to name the, the school, and I had all kinds of positive experiences there, but this was a New England boarding school of, under heavily Episcopal auspices, for what that's worth. This is from a Hollywood movie about uh, a Jewish student at a New England boarding school, and I may have a comment to make about this picture later on. But uh, I will say that my awakening to the, to the very existence of anti-Semitism occurred, I can remember the moment uh, it cropped up for me, and it happened uh, on an evening during my freshman year. Uh, first snowfall of the winter, after dark, after dinner, there was a massive snowball fight uh, that pervaded the entire boys' campus. It was a very exciting and exhilarating moment. And I charged out there with all my dorm mates and just had a great, great ball. And what excitement it was. I felt, all of a sudden, I felt at home in this environment until... I saw, I can't remember if it was a guy on the opposing snowball team or on my snowball team, but there was a guy out there. He was a, I think he was the quarterback on the football team, and he had a big garbage lid, and he had spray painted a white swastika on the garbage lid. And all of a sudden, that snowball fight stopped being fun for me, as you might imagine. And I realized, okay, I'm in a different world now. I should have mentioned that I came to that New England boarding school from Greenwich Village, which is where I grew up in New York City, which was the last, you know, was sort of about as far away from that environment as a person could be. So I really wasn't used to uh, anti-Semitism at all. Now, over the four years that I was at the school, the anti-Semitism I experienced took the familiar form of slurs and jokes and physical intimidation, uh, and probably most significant, a, a pretty high degree from time to time of social ostracization. Now, I'm not claiming that these experiences to, are of any great significance. Uh, and I also think it's important for me to say that the privilege that I incurred by being at such a school and by being able to learn in such an environment may very well, in the, in the overall scheme of things, outweigh the uh, trauma, if that's, the, I don't even think of it as trauma, but whatever it is. Uh, I think the privilege is, it's important for me to mention that this was a privileged environment that I happen to have access to. It was not the official policy of this school to discriminate against Jews or anyone else, but the social discrimination that I experienced and that a handful of other uh, Jews experienced in this school, there were probably in a student uh, body of about 600, I think there were maybe 10 uh, Jewish students who were known to be Jewish. There were a few who were 
uh, you know, who kept it on the down low, including my best friend who uh, got through four years there not being known uh, to be a Jew. But that social discrimination really is instructive about um, the components of American anti-Semitism. Now here's where we pause for our first interaction because I want you all to have a few minutes to speak to whoever you'd like to speak to next to you about anti-Semitism that you either, either experienced yourself or witnessed. I'm interested and we'll come back together in about five, six minutes or so. I wanna know what forms it took. What forms does anti-Semitism in America take? So take a few minutes, speak to your neighbor. Again, if you weren't the target of it, you may perhaps have witnessed it. Uh, and all we need to know is what forms it took. So have a little conversation about that and uh, we'll come back. I, I, will, I will call your attention back here in about six or seven minutes. I'm so glad that um, people have had this opportunity to speak to each other. And as much as I would like to hear every single one of the stories that was just recounted, and I heard of, uh, some uh, harrowing stories from the people that I was just talking to, I'm going to try to focalize uh, the, the sort of composite experience here. So I'm going to ask you very simply right now, raise your hand if the story that you told or heard uh, included physical violence. Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, and raise your hand if uh, the anti-Semitism involved verbal intimidation. Uh, and uh, number three, uh, if it involved being singled out or humiliated in public. Social isolation. Literal exclusion, being kept out of something, you know, officially. Uh, other forms, is, is there anybody who would speak to another form other than the ones I've just described? Yeah. You did mention in smaller communities and all, uh, we were a novelty. So just being looked at as a novelty. Yeah, yeah. Ex the exotic. Yes, okay, it being exoticized. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. And, yes? I can. Uh, uh, you can hear me better about uh, the math. Uh, in, oh, I'm sorry, I can give you the microphone if you like. Okay. Uh, in a college, I uh, went to Michigan State, it, and uh, yeah, there were only like a handful of Jews in the, in the in that university, and uh, we, the religion de department, had courses in every religion in the world except for Judaism, mm -hmm. and so a handful of us Jews tried to petition the administration to have a, just a single course like like Judaism 101, the basic introduction. And they kept saying, oh no, the university doesn't have the, have the, have the money to add, a, add any more courses, and there aren't any classrooms that are free, and there's nobody who is willing to uh, 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 teach the course, mm. and no one would show up because no one's interested in, in mm. Judaism. And next uh, semester, I was going through the course catalog to find a you know, what you know, next set of courses to sign up for, and it was a course on a Jewish history that was was listed, and so out of a curiosity, I enrolled in the course. And the first day of class, the instructor said that anti-Semitism does not does not exist, that the Jews were a bunch of, of liars. That they, they they made up stories like a Jew wrote the protocols of the elders of Zion and blamed and blamed Christians for, for it, and the Jews blamed uh, Christians for uh, claiming that that a Christian is saying that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus, and the Jews are just a bunch of, of, of liars, and they controlled all the uh, governments in the world and all the you know, banks in the world and the Holocaust and never happened, blah, blah, blah. 
So oh, that's one of the that, That's, uh, that's oh. a chastening uh, story oh, yeah. to hear, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Okay, so let's try to understand, now that we've thought about the forms that anti-Semitism mm -hmm. take and has taken in the United States, let's try to understand the sources that explain it. That's really my, uh, that's what I take uh, as my job tonight. So uh, I want to mention, going back to my experiences, but this will also relate to other experiences that people have just been describing, basically three themes that I said. The first, uh, and so I, I'm going to introduce to you now essentially three ways in which I think American history is distinct from the history of many other nation states, at least in the Western world, uh, and ways in which American anti-Semitism follows suit in accordance with these three themes. The first one has to do with American beliefs concerning the role of religion in public life. Now, when I was at Kent, oh, I, I said the name of the school by accident. When I was, when I was at that nameless uh, New England boarding school, I was afforded the right to worship as I wished, right? In accordance with this old-fashioned tenet that we have, even that applies to private schools, right? Uh, there was no way that they were going to prevent Jewish students from being themselves. And the school held Friday night services for Jewish students, and if you attended those services, you were actually excused from going to the Sunday services at the Episcopal Chapel there. Nonetheless, uh, in my experience there, I was surrounded day from day to day by the trappings of Christianity, by a thoroughly Christian culture, especially around holidays, especially around Christmas and Easter. Uh, or also, for that matter, if I attended Friday services, which I usually did, even though I wasn't the least bit religious, um, everyone knew about it because the, uh, they had people that would go around checking dorm rooms. And if they showed up in your dorm room to see if you were in chapel, you said, well, I didn't go, I'm Jewish. Well, all the prefects at the school knew who the Jews were. So there was no way to, uh, in other words, there is the tenet of uh, religious as a private matter in the United States, but that is not the case for Jews, and it isn't the case for other, let's say, religious outliers. Uh, so that's one factor I'd like to speak to. Um, there was nothing private about uh, my religious identity in that environment, despite the assumption that in America, religion is a private matter. Second theme, uh, another way in which America distinguishes itself from the rest of the world, it won't surprise you to hear that there is the question of racial identity. And so uh, the question is, what side of the color line are Jews on? <clears throat> now, I'm not going to claim that the discrimination I experienced, mostly from students, sometimes from teachers, had any basis of comparison to the extreme harassment that black and Asian students experienced in this environment. I'm not making that claim at all. But uh, certainly, especially in that sort of what I would say a much less empathetic uh, phase of American history, the 70s and 80s. Still, when I was harassed, and here's where the racial component comes into it, it was frequently on, frequently on the basis of my vis vis uh, uh, visibly Jewish physiognomy. Like, um, that's just where I want to talk about that picture. In that picture of the boarding school boys, you can't tell which one of them is Jewish. But when I was around, you could tell. And so very often the harassment that I experienced in that environment had to do with physically my appearance, which is basically an assumption of a certain Jewish racial characteristic. Um, so there is that. And then finally, uh, the third theme that I'll be talking about in American history is the theme of economic class. Now it happens that I came from an academic family and the great majority of students in that school came from financially, you know, from uh, Wall Street people and lawyers and things like that. But that didn't make any difference because the stereotypes, stereotypes concerning opulent and money-grubbing Jews like these Rothschilds were applied to me, right? If uh, I can't, can't remember how many times if a penny fell on the floor, some idiot would say, oh, Hoberman's going to go jump for that penny, right? So that, that, that uh, argument around economic class, and the thing is, you can't win that battle, right? Because either you're money grubbing uh, and you're opulent, or you don't live up to the class standard. In other words, you don't look preppy enough, you don't fit in. So either way, Jews are the losers when that theme emerges. In all of these instances, the hostility that people expressed towards me as a Jew was a function of unresolved tension 
regarding religion, race, and class in American culture. And that's the argument I'll be making, is that anti-Semitism in America is an extension of unresolved tensions in those three areas. In the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about the sources of tension that I've referred to so far <laughs> regarding religious affiliation, race, and ideas about social class. Each of them is a product of a discreetly American historical experience. In each instance, I will describe, you know, shed light on the theme, and then try to offer some historically instructive episodes accompanied by slides that will shed light on exactly how these themes emerge uh, and, uh, as anti-Semitism. Anti this is not the same, by the way, as an argument for American exceptionalism. And I, I want to make it clear that I'm not arguing uh, just in the same way that uh, Americans are uh, Americans are not the chosen people in the world any more than, than Jews are the chosen people. And I'm not claiming that America is any way better or worse or more special or destined either divinely or manifestly to improve or destroy humanity. American history is accidental and contingent just like the history of other, every other place. Um, there's no, again, there's no mystical element here. These are all about contingencies. So let's start with our first theme, which is the ways in which the history of religion in the United States has been a unique one. I thought I would ask if maybe one or two people might want to uh, address this, this uh, task right now. You want to offer a, does anyone want to offer a sense that would summarize the role of religion in American life? Does anyone want to say, I can sum up the role of religion in American life in one sense? Okay, I'm gonna give the, the microphone to Diane, Danielle. I'd say we're Jew-ish. It's kind of ish. Okay. That's the role of religion in American life. Anyone else want to sum up? I don't, when I say religion, I mean all religions. What role does religion play in American life? Okay. I'm going to give Terry a chance, and then I'm going to go back to the lectern. It's a cult. <laughs> okay. Well, we have some interesting ideas here. So let me go back to my theme and to our, our history. We're used to hearing that the earliest European settlers came to North America to find religious freedom. That's certainly part of the, the conventional narrative. British North America in the colonial era was the product of the Protestant Reformation and of economic changes that accompanied it. We're talking again about the 16 and 1700s. The expansion of a trans-oceanic market. And many of the English settlers who came to places like Massachusetts in particular, they came here to get away from an established church, uh, which they associated with Catholicism. That's the religious history that kind of underpins the, uh, the, at least the, the settlement of British North America. You're familiar with these people, the Puritans. Owing to this factor, and this is where, uh, this is where you get the origin of religious tolerance, as we call it, it's sort of an ironic outcome, Colonists were zealous in their efforts to prevent any one denomination from attaining the upper hand. Uh, and so there's an irony here because basically the theocracy that the Puritans created it was sort of laid the groundwork for religious freedom because these guys were so jealous lest anyone else take over the reins of church that they wouldn't permit any church to predominate. And that is how we got religious tolerance. So it's sort of a backwards way, but all the same, it is how things got to be this way. Now, if we take a look, if we advance our clock a little bit to the time of the American Revolution, a little bit afterwards, I'm gonna show you one document that sheds a little bit of light on this concept of religious tolerance and of religion as a private matter, whether it is or not. Um, and that would be, I'll advance to this slide here. You've perhaps seen pictures, or maybe you've been to the Turo Synagogue. And one of the things that puts this synagogue on the map of Newport, Rhode Island, is the letter that you see printed here from George Washington. I have a laser pointer, and I'll even use it right now. I'll remember to use it. So uh, in 1790, Washington is inaugurated as the first president. And uh, the Jewish congregations, like many of the Christian congregations, write him congratulatory letters. He sends a letter, among others, to the Newport Jews, thanking them for their support during the American Revolution. And it's in this letter, this is a very famous American document, it's in this letter that he speaks these, uh, you know, really profound, powerful, inspiring words. It is no more, now no more the toleration is spoken of as it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. 
Because the government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, and requires only that people who live in the United States demean themselves as good citizens. So Washington is basically saying everybody, including Jews, has a right to practice their religion behind the walls of their synagogues or churches, and nobody's going to bother them as long as they participate in American civic life. And the Jews had done so, many of them had done so during the revolution, which I'll speak to. Um, there were, I guess you could say that um, uh, the, the synagogue itself is actually an example of that, and, and many architectural historians have pointed out that when you look at the Turo Synagogue, if you walk around Newport today, you'll see it doesn't look any different from any of the other buildings in Newport. In other words, the Jews built a building for their worship that looked like all the other public buildings in the town, uh, and this was deliberate because, again, the idea was that worship was a private matter. If you walk into the synagogue, you see this very ornate opulent, beautiful worship space, which is very distinctly Jewish, very distinctly Sephardic Jewish, but on the outside it looks like every other building in Newport. Okay, so let's talk about the American Revolution a little bit. Um, I have two episodes to speak of from the Revolutionary period, and then uh, a single episode from the Civil War I want to talk about again, where the idea of religion as a private matter is contested. Uh, at the time of the American Revolution, there were about 2,500 Jews in, in North America. Just to uh, remind you about that conflict, that's the one where George Washington uh, led the way. About 200 of these 2,500 Jews were combatants during the war. Uh, many more were bystanders, witnesses, and economic casualties. Basically, all Americans were economic casualties of the war. There's more evidence to suggest that Jews supported the revolution that, than opposed it. There were loyalist Jews, some pretty well known, but for the most part, Jews uh, uh, aligned themselves. Once the war began, they aligned themselves with uh, the, the cause of American independence. That being said, in the immediate aftermath of the war, there were all kinds of accusations that the Jews had been disloyal. And so that's where we get our first episodes of anti-Semitism that I'm speaking of, again, on the theme of whether religion is a private matter or not. Um, so here we're going to hear about uh, this person in 1784. So the Revolutionary War ends in 1783, and one year later, a former Tory, Tory uh, this guy, Myers Fisher, uh, he's not Jewish, you'll understand, you'll believe me in a second when you hear what he says. Myers Fisher is a, a um, a uh, broker in Philadelphia, and he writes a published uh, he writes a letter in the Philadelphia newspaper in opposition to the founding of, of a United States a national bank, and he is against the uh, creation of a national bank because he thinks that a national bank will just create open the door to Jewish usurers, uh, and in particular he decides that the worst of the Jewish usurers is this guy, who you may have heard of. This is Chaim Solomon. He's a Polish-born Jew who actually was one of the great financiers of the Revolutionary War, uh, lent quite a bit of money to the Continental cause for which he was never paid back. And uh, so Chaim Solomon, uh, good for him, uh, he writes a letter in response to Fisher's accusation, and he says essentially to Fisher, it's interesting that you're saying that. I was loyal to the Revolutionary cause. I actually fought under arms and did my part, as did many other Jews, and you, Myers Fisher, were a Tory, which was true. Tor uh, Fisher had been a Tory. But that didn't protect Jews or Solomon from the accusation that, again, despite the idea that religion was a private matter, that somehow, by virtue of being a Jew, he couldn't be counted upon to be loyal. Um, 1800, so this, uh, ex, uh, we're, we're moving uh, into history a little bit further. 1800, we have the story of this guy, Benjamin Nones. So in 1800, there's a great uh, crisis. In some ways, there's a comparison to be made between this crisis and the one that I think we're sort of in right now, a uh, crisis of extreme polarization. And the polarization in 1800 had to do with the rivalry between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Right, the Anti-Federalists represented primarily by Je uh, Thomas Jefferson. And the issue at hand was the war uh, that Britain and France were fighting and which side would the United States join. 
If you were a Federalist, you favored uh, basically assisting Britain, despite the fact that we had just defeated Britain 25 years earlier or less than that. And if you were an anti-Federalist, if you were Jeffersonian, you supported the French and the cause of the French Revolution. So very quickly, the accusation is made of Jews, again, in Philadelphia, in particular this man, Benjamin Nonus, uh, who was actually born in France, but had fought under arms in the Continental Army, was actually a, 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 a combat veteran of the Continental Army. He's accused of being uh, anti-American. He's accused of having dual loyalties uh, and accused and, and, and told that he can't be counted upon uh, and Jews like him can't be counted upon to be loyal to America. Um, a, a recent historian who's just written a, a book about Jews in the American Revolutionary War puts it this way. The Federalists, who were the accusers, quote, thought that America had to Christianize because, before it could unify. Uh, and Milnes, of course, uh, like uh, Haim Solomon before him, has, uh, isn't, isn't, doesn't hesitate to uh, refute the charge and says in his response, also published um, in a Philadelphia newspaper, quote, I am proud of being a Jew, of being a Republican, and of being poor. And then he also goes on to say, how can a Jew but be a Republican, which is to say a Jeffersonian, because of the, uh, the politics of that time. He defended his honor on the basis of his military service and said that his Jewish background had no bearing on his loyalty. His attackers saw things differently, obviously. Their accusations manifested the tension that remained unresolved in their minds. And again, to them, to the accusers, to the anti-Semites, a Jew was not a person who was entitled to be a Jew privately. A Jew was obviously publicly an enemy of the state. All right, we're gonna skip about, whatever, four score and, and eight years or so to the time of the Civil War. Um, uh, four, four score and six years, or whatever it is. Uh, now, when we get to the time of the Civil War, and we're still on the theme of uh, whether religion is a private or a public matter, right? There are about 150,000 Jews in, in uh, the United States at this time. So the, the population has grown immensely, particularly in the last, basically the 15 years before the Civil War broke out, an enormous number of German immigrants come uh, in response to the uh, uprisings of 1848. Of these 150,000 Jews in America, about eight to 10,000 served in both armies uh, in, in the war, probably about a third of them for the Confederacy and the other two thirds for the Union. This slide gives you two brothers who fought on opposite sides. It's an old story. We hear about the Civil War all the time, brother versus brother. Well, this is Jewish brother versus Jewish brother, the Jonas brothers. Um, okay, Jews were loyal to both sides during the Civil War. Union Jews were reliably loyal, like most other Northerners, to the Union. They were not necessarily abolitionists, and this is an interesting story that can be gone into. Uh, this is uh, just sort of a sidelight here, but the, the cause of abolitionists was very heavily Protestant, and it very often alienated Jews. So there were some Jewish abolitionists, but for the most part, Jewish uh, people on the, on, the, on the northern side of the Mason-Dixon line were loyal to the Union and perhaps indifferent on the matter of slavery. That's neither here nor there, nor there but that's just the fact. Um, accusations of disloyalty were made on both sides. Uh, the story of this person is quite well known. Judah Benjamin, uh, sometimes referred to as the brains of the Confederacy, he held three different cabinet posts under Jefferson Davis, and basically every time something went wrong for the Confederates, he was the person to be blamed because he was a Jew. So again, his religion was not a private matter, notwithstanding the fact that he was not an observant Jew in the least, and had married a Catholic woman, but besides that, he was known publicly to be a Jew, and that was always held against him. He did not have the privilege of being able to uh, say and assert that religion was a private matter. Probably the, the most infamous uh, incident of the Civil War uh, regarding Jews is this uh, one, which is General Order Number 11, given by this uh, great hero of the North, U.S. Grant, on December 17, 1862. Grant issued this order, which uh, effectively dismissed all Jews from the Department of Tennessee. This was in the, the, the very heavily battled area between Tennessee and Kentucky. And Grant decided that Jewish um, merchants were smuggling cotton across enemy lines. And so he decided to dismiss all the Jews from that district. It is 
with one exception, with one uh, sort of provisional exception, which I'll talk about later, the only government order which recognized Jews as a class and essentially discriminated against them uh, you know, as a class and kicked them out of a certain area. Fortunately, uh, within days of this order being issued, Abraham Lincoln overturned it. Uh, very quickly because Ab uh, Lincoln was in touch with Jews and he was very quickly convinced that Grant was out of his mind when he issued the order. For that matter, Grant later apologized and kind of redeemed himself uh, uh, before the Jews. There's a great book on this subject by Jonathan Sarna, by the way, when, Grant, uh, when General Grant expelled the Jews, came out about 10 years ago, that goes into great detail about this incident. In any case, we're talking about an unresolved tension in American culture. We cannot make up our minds whether a person's religious beliefs pose a threat to the national interest, despite the popular notion that religious belief is a matter of private conscience. Jews, of course, are not the only group of people who have been singled out this way. And here's where my provisional other example comes up. I was teaching a class about General Order Number 11 a few years ago. It was in 2016. And I announced to the class, oh, general order number 11, the only time that a government official issued an order dismissing any religious group as a class, and somebody in the student, uh, some, a student in the class raised their hand and said, what about the Muslim ban? So, uh, which of course didn't go through, but that is in fact, that would have been the second instance in American history of a religious group being singled out despite the uh, you know, official policy of religious tolerance. Okay, let's go to our second theme. The second theme, as I mentioned before, is the issue of this, the theme of race. I'm gonna invite people again, maybe two people want to sum up this question. Does anyone want to sum up what is the status, the racial status of American Jews? Would anyone care to say what the racial status of American Jews is? Go ahead. Other. 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 Okay, that's one answer. Anyone else want to try that one out? Ambiguous, thank you. So we have other and ambiguous, uh, and those are pretty useful words in this context. Let's look at some historical episodes to shed light. To put it simply, Jews in the United States may not always been have been perceived or treated as white, but they have rarely been classed as black. Of course, there are Jews of color, and that's a separate story, but Jews as a whole in general have rarely been classed as black. The status of Jews in the United States has been shaped by the reality that non-whites, whether Native American, black, or Asian, have been marked as racially visible outsiders to the culture. Uh, and so the ambiguous, there's that word again, the ambiguous racial status of Jews in the United States has contributed to their experiences of discrimination. Now the history of Jews and blacks, of course, in America is complex and fraught. We idealize certain images, and this is certainly the most idealizing image I can think of. Uh, this is the, the, the uh, alliance, let's say, the purported alliance, the provisional alliance that existed at the height of the civil rights era. And here you see Abraham Heschel with uh, MLK marching together. It's the assumption that Jews and blacks are or ought to be natural allies because of their quote unquote shared experience of discrimination. And this is epitomized, I wanna tell you a little story here. It's epitomized, because there's a certain amount of desire that undergirds that thinking. And uh, here's the story I'm gonna tell you. So I'm writing, I have a book coming out about um, basically the mythology of Jewish history in America. And there's an anecdote that I bring up in that book that has to do with that Turo synagogue I showed you before. I was, um, I think I was uh, doing a Zoom lecture on the history of the Turo synagogue and one of the listeners uh, you know, raised their hand and said, is it true what I heard that the Turo Synagogue uh, hid uh, escaped slaves on the Underground Railroad? And I had never heard this story before and I, I didn't have an answer for the person. I said, well, I'll check that out. But I was pretty sure that the answer was no. And in fact, the answer was no. And the reason the answer was no is that when there was an underground railroad, which is really in the middle decades of the 19th century, there weren't any Jews in Newport. <laughs> the Jews in Newport were there during the Revolutionary War and then they left for various reasons. So there weren't any Jews to let anybody into that synagogue in the first place. But it's a legend that has legs. I found it written about in a couple different books. And the reason this legend has legs 
has to do with the desire, I think, on the part of the American Jewish community to be on the right side of history, to want to think of ourselves as being want, marching there with MLK, but of course that isn't always and hasn't always been the case. So there's desire is always a factor here. Uh, on a more comic note, and this is just news emergent uh, from uh, yesterday, a text message that I received from a friend of mine. I don't know if you know this, but Larry David, it turns out, has a Confederate ancestor, um, the great comedian. And not only that, but Larry David's Confederate ancestor was a slave owner. And there's an episode of him on the show with Henry Louis Gates, whatever that, that show is called, where he makes that discovery. And he's dumbfounded. He's dumbfounded. How could that possibly be? So this is a story we don't want to hear, but it is a story that has to be heard. And that naturally has an effect on the shapes that anti-Semitism has taken in the United States, particularly on the question of race. I want to call uh, to your attention uh, some really important writing by this person. I'm sure you're familiar with James Baldwin. I'm gonna, this is the first time I'm gonna actually read a long quotation from somebody, but here is Baldwin writing in 1967, explaining what was then referred to as Negro anti-Semitism. So here's Baldwin's for you. Uh, I'm gonna start right here. When we were growing up in Harlem, our demoralizing series of landlords were Jewish, and we hated them. We hated them because they were terrible landlords and did not take care of the building. A coat of paint, a broken window, a stopped sink, a stopped toilet, a sagging floor, a broken ceiling, a dangerous stairwell, the question of garbage disposal, the question of heat and cold, of roaches and rats, all questions of life and death for the poor, and especially for those with children, we had to cope with all of these as best we could. Our parents were lashed to futureless jobs in order to pay the outrageous rent. We knew that the landlord treated us this way only because we were colored and we knew that we could not move out. So basically Baldwin is saying, if there was such a thing in his Harlem of his growing up, if there was such a thing as anti-Semitism, it was anti-whiteism, right? Jews in his world were white people who did the th same things that the white supremacists were doing around the world. And in fact, uh, a historian of uh, the Jewish Southern experience has said something uh, along the same lines. Basically, the most common relationship between Southern Jews and blacks was a commercial one, right? We have to take into account that Jews in many cities and rural areas in the United States occupied the, the, the status of commercial, a commercial class and were in black communities and very often perceived as exploiters. Jews have had to negotiate a delicate balance between going along with American racial norms of white supremacy and pushing against them, right? So marching with MLK, but charging those rents, right? Those, the, the, so the Jew, that word, those words of ambiguous and other, they come to mind again. Now, racial tension between US blacks and Jews rose in particular around this episode in 1913. I think there's some images on that uh, projector about this as well. This has to do with the Leo Frank case, so I'm gonna speak about that briefly. Leo Frank, uh, on April 20th, 1913, he was a, a New York-born German-Jewish industrialist in Georgia, and he was arrested for the murder of a teenage white girl employee named Mary Fagan. A black janitor in that factory uh, by the name of Jim Conley was the prime uh, prosecution witness, and he claimed, Conley did, to have carried Fagan's dead body to a coal cellar where the body was later found. Jews and blacks in this community, as the same uh, Southern uh, historian has, has written, said uh, basically had, quote, a mutual reliance on the dominant white Gentile majority. So both the Jews needed approval from the white Gentiles, and so too in this particular case around Leo Frank, so too did the blacks. Now, a, a, an important consideration here is that Frank's lawyers, the lawyers who were defending Leo Frank, these charges were, were uh, illegitimate because Frank, as we now know, had not committed the murder, but none the same, nonetheless, Frank's lawyers had tried to implicate Conley, that is, they tried to implicate the black janitor, quote, by pandering to popular stereotypes of the black rapist. So the Jewish lawyers, or the lawyers defending the Jew in this case, were essentially buying into black stereotypes. The governor of Georgia commuted Frank's sentence, uh, but Frank, uh, as many of you probably know, was lynched by a mob in 1915. 
In the context of American racial politics, both blacks and Gentile whites benefited, in this instance, from their resort to anti-Semitism. All right, I'm skipping a few uh, decades here to uh, the story of the Nation of Islam and the story uh, that you might be familiar, the, the most familiar story to many of us concerning the Nation of Islam, of course, is the one we read in Malcolm X's autobiography. But of course, connected to the Nation of Islam as well is this guy who is still living, Louis Farrakhan. Uh, he joins the Nation of Islam in 1955. By the way, the jury is still out as to whether or not he had something to do with Malcolm X's assassination. Uh, there are all kinds of accusations there. But all the same, um, he has made, throughout his career, Farrakhan has made numerous anti-Semitic anti pronouncements over the course of his career, including in 2015, accusing Israel and the US of being behind 9-11. He attacked Obama, quote, for surrounding himself with Jews. He's a prominent Holocaust denier. Uh, and most notably, in 1991, he publishes a book, uh, which is still, from what I can tell from Amazon, a big seller called The Secret La Relationship Between Blacks and Jews. This book essentially fabricates uh, a, a, a bunch of historical evidence suggesting that Jews in antebellum America were the primary uh, dealers and slaves were the people who invented and ran the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and it is the case that in 2000, a well-regarded uh, Jewish American historian named Ellie Faber wrote a very elaborate and very well-researched uh, rebuttal to the secret rel relationship between blacks and Jews. But guess which book sells more copies? This one. So the upshot here is that anti-Semitism in the United States has often been shaped by the fact that the main driver in American history is tension between blacks and whites. That's the contention I'm making, that uh, in, in the case of anti-Semitism here, anti-Semitism, uh, as it bears on race in America, is a, an extension of this reality. The tension between blacks and whites, which permeates and has always permeated American history. While the sources of black anti-Semitism can sometimes and perhaps should be, right? We should try to understand them. However, it's important to remember that hurtful pronouncements and actions on anyone's part can't help but pose a threat to the people on the receiving end of those pronouncements and actions. Okay, I have one third and final theme here, uh, and this is economics and the issue of class. So, would somebody like to, in one sentence or one word, as we had last time, would anybody care to summarize the relationship between Jews and the American dream? Is that some, all right, we've got a taker on that one. I think Jews are widely regarded as being a very successful um, participant in the American dream. That you know, they, they came here poor and they became rich. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, we'll, we'll, oh yes, we do have somebody, Dale. Damned if they're successful, damned if they're not. Thank you. Okay, so let's take this all into consideration and look at some more episodes uh, from American history that might shed some light. Um, there's a different course that I teach which is instructive here. I teach a course every couple of years on American folklore, uh, you know, which has very uh, little, if any, uh, relevance to anti-Semitism. Um, but there's an article that I often teach in that course which has to do with the stories that people tell in American families about uh, financial misfortune. And uh, it's, uh, folklore has collected all these stories among American families back in the 70s. And the upshot of his article is that basically, in America, anyone can make it. Uh, and economic success is the product of individual uh, initiative. And that failure stems from individual failing. Uh, the extension of this idea is the one that I've often noticed, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing, that basically all Americans are middle class. The poorest people aspire to be middle class. The richest people deny that they're rich and say also that they're middle class. And what this comes down to is that in the American ideology and popular imagination, um, basically, um, we can't make up our minds about uh, economic class. Americans don't want to face up to the reality of economic class. When you don't want to face up to a reality, all kinds of crazy things happen. Freud talked about the return of the repressed. So anti-Semitism around economic issues is an example of that, where people's 
failure to address real profound problems around economic class manifest as, uh, as uh, anti-Semitism in many instances. Jewish economic success in the United States, as Dale was saying, has always been a double-edged sword. Uh, it's allowed access for many to privilege and status. Sometimes it's inspired admiration on the part of non-Jews. It's also, at the same time, garnered resentment, which wells up more often than not in the spirit, at least in the first 20, 30 years of the 20th century at the end, and also from the late 19th century in the spirit of populism. Populism, which is resurgent now, by the way. Uh, but from much more recent headlines, I think a, a good example of this uh, inability to really make up our minds about economic class is manifested in the electoral politics of the, ver of the very day we're on. And this has to do with some, a story I picked up uh, a, a week or two ago where uh, Kamala Harris was invoking her years of working at McDonald's as sort of a badge of honor. And Donald Trump, of course, his uh, invocation of a badge of honor has to do with his gargantuan wealth. And neither one of these stories really addresses the economic realities that face most Americans, right? But uh, Americans want, at, all at the same time, we want to embrace the idea of modest origins, and we also want to worship at the feet of gargantuan wealth. We can't make up our minds where we fit. Uh, and here, again, is where anti-Semitism comes from. Now, I didn't coin this phrase, this is, but it's a very useful phrase if you're trying to understand economic connections to anti-Semitism, and that is that anti-Semitism is the socialism of fools. I'm sure you've heard that before, but it bears repeating, right? And so very much of the story of anti-Semitism, not just here, but in other parts of the world, has to do with that idea. <clears throat> now, um, a, a historian named Hasya Diner has recently written that uh, in basically we're talking about late 19th and the first half of the 20th century, that anti-Semitism in the United States came from the top down, from elitist sources, and from the bottom up, from populist sources. So let's start with the bottom up, and we'll take a look at the story here. This is from 1896, William Jennings Bryant, the great um, progressive hero from the Midwest. So he delivers a speech at the Democratic Convention, which has gone down in history as the Cross of Gold speech. He's speaking against the gold standard and in favor of economic populism. And the concluding line of this rousing speech is, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Uh, echoes, in other words, of ancient Christian prejudice, uh, prejudices. Brian has been written about extensively, and many historians will argue that he's not an anti-Semite in his own personal life. Nonetheless, the implications of that line are uh, difficult to, uh, to ignore. And it is also said that when he delivered that line, a chant went up among the audience members, quote, down with the hook-nosed Shylocks, down with the Christ-killing God bugs. So there you go. This economic populism manifested in this instance in anti-Semitism. Another Midwestern politician, uh, Ignatius Donnelly, argued, quote, Jewish bankers are working to turn farmers into serfs. Okay, those are your bottom-up examples, and now we have the top-down. Uh, here's Henry Ford. Um, Ford, of course, publishes the Dearborn Independent in 1918, arguing in it that Jews are behind strikes, financial disasters, and uh, agricultural depressions. I saw there's a slide uh, corresponding to this one on that uh, projector over there that tells you that um, everybody who bought a Model T got a, cop got a copy of the Dearborn Independent. Also, Ford published uh, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a very famous, internationally famous, uh, fabricated uh, anti-Semitic um, book. His newspaper is widely distributed, as we've mentioned. Uh, okay, so this is the 1920s. We get to the 1930s, the Depression. That fuels more anti-Semitic fires, including in rural areas. Um, and then, of course, when you get into the middle of the 1930s, you also find anti-Semitism, populist anti-Semitism, class-based anti-Semitism on the part of industrial workers in cities of the North. And this is where Charles Coughlin comes into the story, right? So uh, his publication, Social Justice, has 250,000 subscribers, speaks to a largely, whereas the populists like John and Brian are speaking to farmers, this guy is speaking to uh, a largely Catholic urban and industrial worker base. 
Among other things, he rails not only against Jewish bankers and financiers, but union leaders, arguing that New York Jews with, quote, white collar jobs in the union bureaucracy were trying to tell blue collar workers who had been fired how to fight the bosses. Um, Coughlin uh, is, you know, he, he's operating in the Midwest. But he has, there's a ripple effect for his radio broadcasts and his newspapers, and that ripple effect is actually felt as close to home as right in Boston, where this group, uh, the Christian Front, actually uh, instigated a series of anti-Semitic riots in Boston in the 1930s. There's a fantastic book about these guys that came out a few years ago. Um, so again, a, a form of, t of both uh, bottom, top-down and bottom-up economic anti-Semitism manifesting both in rural and industrial areas. So, I'm gonna bring it to a conclusion here. We've, I've spoken to you about these three themes, uh, and I will say that basically in the current era, anti-Semitism in the United States has assumed new shapes, but the same basic principles I've outlined still apply. I think we're at the time where we should be doing a brief Q&A and then moving to smaller groups. So let's, let's move in that direction. Thank you.